Hi there, and thanks for joining me this morning. My name is Ian. I'm the pastor here at Hillside Christian Church, and our mission as a church is to see people connected to Jesus. We believe that when that happens, good things happen, that people are connected to Jesus and experience grace, this undeserved goodness from God that he just pours out on us again and again and again, and also that they experience transformation, that they are changed. And that's one of the things we've been talking about since Easter, and that we're going to continue exploring a little bit in the weeks to come about how the resurrection changes us. Two weeks ago, we talked about how God brings us from fear to joy. Last week, we talked about locking things out and inviting things into our lives. And this morning, we're talking about God moving us from doubt to faith. I'm so glad that you are joining me this morning for that. Let me start by asking you this. What was your first response when you first heard about the coronavirus? What was your initial response? I think a lot of people responded and it kind of went like this, Corona, what? That's so funny, I'm going on a cruise. I think for a lot of us at first, we just weren't concerned at all. It seemed like this thing so far away. That's happening over in China. I live here in a cul-de-sac in Cloverdale. I'm not worried about this at all. I don't know of anybody here who rushed out to buy an N95 mask or stock up on soap or sanitizer. But I think then our responses started to change as we went to a store maybe and saw that uh, a bunch of the aisles were empty. All the toilet paper was gone. All the meat was gone. All, all the frozen section had been wiped out. I think our perspective started to change. And, and then when we were told about needing to self-distance and self-isolate, I think some people thought, well, this sounds great. I can work from home and maybe I'll be able to read some books. I won't waste all that time on the commute. There's some shows on Netflix I've been wanting to watch. This will be fantastic. Or maybe some of us thought, home with my kids. I can teach my kids at home. I'll love that. And we had this kind of romantic picture, this idea of what it might be like. But the dream is over and now it's turned into this nightmare and we're ready to send our kids back to school. We love you children and here you go. I think our perspective has been changing. And I think now lots of people, after being uh, self-isolated or self-distancing for over a month now, are saying, when will this end? I'm sick of it. I'm tired of it. I've seen all the graphs. I've seen all the projections. I've seen all the charts that I can ever want to see in my whole life. I'm done. When can we go back to some kind of normal? Whether we know it or not, our perspectives have been changing, and I think it's also been changing us. I wonder how many of you might have a parent or grandparent who lived through the Great Depression or the Second World War. Maybe you'd go to your house and wonder to yourself, why do they have 30 cans of canned chicken? That just seems weird to me. And one day your grandkids will likely come to your house and say, why do you have 300 rolls of toilet paper on the shelf? That just seems weird to me. Whether we know it or not, our perspectives have been changed, and we've been changed in some way. And the resurrection does that to us. Jesus changes us as well, our perspectives and us, who we are inside. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or you are a Muslim or a Buddhist or an atheist or a skeptic or whatever camp you might put yourself in. The Bible says, says that we all start in the very same place with God. I want to read that for you, a verse that talks exactly about that. It says this, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So according to the Bible, we all started off in the same place. We all started off cut off from God, separated from him. It even goes on to say that we were at, po at that point enemies of God. And then it says, but God. The God who is rich in mercy made us alive. God's the one who's done this incredible thing in our lives God has made us alive. 
Maybe you've heard a Christian before say that they've been born again. That's what they're talking about, that they've been born not into a life of doubt, but they've been born now into a life of faith, born not as enemies of God, but as children of God. They've had this new start, this new beginning, this new birth as followers and believers in Jesus. But what if you've had that and still have doubts? What if you're a Christian and you still doubt or wonder or question things about Jesus or the Holy Spirit or God or the Bible or faith or how all those things are meant to fit together. If you read through the Bible, you'll find out that all the great heroes of the faith had doubts. People like Abraham and Sarah, Moses, King David, Elijah, the list just goes on and on and on. It almost seems like doubts and questions are part of the journey. You've probably all heard of the disciple Thomas before, and you've probably all heard him called by his nickname, Doubting Thomas. I want to read part of that passage for you from John chapter 20. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. All the disciples are there when Jesus appears to them, but not Thomas. And so they tell Thomas, look, Jesus has come back from the dead. We've seen him. And he says, oh, hold on. I, I don't believe you. I mean, just put yourself in Thomas's position for a minute. He's seen Jesus be arrested. He's seen him beaten. He's seen him crucified. He's seen him laid in the tomb. And now it's been three days. And now these guys are saying, it's okay. Jesus is back from the grave. Imagine you went to a funeral and then three days later, somebody told you that person that you had just seen buried was back. I think you'd be skeptical as well. What do you mean they're back? Yeah, I, I just saw them at Taco Bell. They're back. I think you'd say, really? I want to see that for myself before I'm totally on board with this whole thing. You know, we call him Doubting Thomas, but the reality is he just has some questions. He just wants some more evidence, some more proof that he can see, that he can touch on his own to confirm that it's real. We call him Doubting Thomas, but the reality is he wasn't always a doubter. In fact, Earlier, Thomas had demonstrated a pretty incredible, rock-solid faith in Jesus. There's this incident that happens earlier in John's Gospel where a friend of Jesus is sick, and Jesus wants to go visit him. But the disciples say, hold on, Jesus, you can't go there because that's back in Judea. And the last time you're in Judea, the people there, the Jews there, they tried to kill you, so you can't go back. But Jesus says that he's going to. Now listen to what Thomas has to say in that situation. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas thinks, the disciples think that Jesus is about to go off and die. And Thomas says, yeah, okay, I'm in. I'll go with you, Jesus, even if that means I'm going to die. That doesn't sound like a doubter to me. That sounds like a guy with just this rock, solid faith and trust and love for Jesus. But they don't end up dying. Instead, they go into this situation where they see Jesus do this amazing miracle and their faith grows, their trust in him grows even more. You know, a challenge that we run into is often people think that when they have a doubt, a question, a concern, when they're not sure about something in their faith, often people withdraw from the church. I don't feel like I fit in anymore. I don't think I should go there. I don't think I can let anyone know I've got this. And so either they withdraw or, or they just sit there silently wrestling with this thing on their own when it would be so much better if they'd just share it. I guarantee you, if you came to my office and said, Pastor Ian, I've just been wrestling with this. I've got this doubt. I guarantee you, I won't throw you out. I won't mock you. I won't heckle you. More than likely, I'll say something like this. Man, I've wondered about that too. Let's dig into this together. Let's wrestle through this together. Because we've all had doubts. We've all been in that place of wondering and questioning. 
And the great thing about those situations is often as you lean into those, as you dig into those, your faith is even stronger as you come through the other side. When people withdraw from the church, when they feel like their questions, their doubts are all alone, that no one else has ever experienced that before, that's often when people's faith just starts to fizzle and fade away altogether. Something I love about this whole situation in John 20 is that there Thomas is. All the other disciples have seen Jesus. They've all told Thomas, hey, we've seen him. You can believe us. And he said, no, I don't believe you. And yet they all seem kind of okay with that. I mean, the other disciples haven't gotten angry with him and kicked him out. Thomas hasn't felt cut off from the group and he still wants to be part of them, still wants to be with them. It seems like they've reached this healthy place of agreeing to disagree and just kind of accepting and loving each other, even though they don't agree on this huge topic. Has Jesus really risen from the grave or not? I love that Thomas is still there and still welcome there, still part of the group. I want to read uh, part of that exchange again for you from John 20. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. Thomas had started out with these doubts, but then Jesus appears. Jesus meets him in his doubts and says, Thomas, take a look, man. Reach out and touch me. It's really me. Here I am. Stop doubting and believe. And then Thomas goes through this huge transformation. His doubts are gone and he makes this huge declaration of faith. My Lord and my God. He doesn't just say, Jesus, nice to see you. Or Jesus, looking better than ever. Or Jesus, I'm so glad you're back. He says, Jesus, I'm changed, but you are changed too. I see it now. I get who you are. You are God. And not just any God, but you are my God, Jesus. See, the great thing about encountering Jesus, the reason our church wants to see people connected to Jesus, is we believe that when you encounter Jesus, he can turn those doubts into faith. There's this idea out there, we don't talk about it as much as we just, I think, believe it. And it's this, that faith is like a light switch. Like either it's on or off, either you have it or you don't. And that's partially true, but it misses the reality that faith is meant to be this growing thing. And the Bible talks about that a lot, that faith is being strengthened or abounding in faith or growing in faith or maturing in faith, that there's this, this trajectory that's intended for our faith, that it should grow even amidst ups and downs and questions and doubts, that it should keep on growing. I mean, even that idea of someone saying, I've been born again, the imagery there is of a new life. Well, think of a woman who delivers a baby they don't measure the baby and weigh the baby and say, okay, this is your kid and this kid's going to be eight pounds for the rest of their lives. Well, no. I mean, right away they're measuring it and weighing it so they have a baseline and then they keep on measuring and weighing to make sure that there's growth. Even before that baby's born, they're taking pictures in the mother's womb. Uh, they're trying to get a baseline of like, is this baby growing even now? Because growth equals health. Our 10-year-old son just uh, yesterday was saying that his legs were sore and his mom said, well, maybe it's growing pains. And so right away he said, growing pains? Let's measure me. I want to see if I really am growing. Sure enough, he's taller than he was last time we measured him. As Jesus moves our doubts to faith, that's great. I mean, that's a miracle. That, that's incredible. But then we want to also continue growing in that gift of faith that we've been given. If you know me at all, you know that I like to lift. I like to go to the gym and just lift some weights. I didn't get pipes like this by just sitting on a couch eating cheesies and watching Netflix all the time. Actually, that's exactly how I got these pipes and uh, I've got nothing to brag about. The last time I was in a gym was probably three years ago and I, it was there by mistake. I thought there was a buffet. 
The reality is when we work out, when we do lift weights, when we do train our bodies, our muscles are stretched, they're challenged, they're exercised, and they actually break down a bit before they grow even stronger. If you feel like you're wrestling with a doubt or a question, if you're in that challenge, you shouldn't see that as a great thing to panic about. Instead, as you dig into it, you could go into that situation knowing that, hey, as I wrestle through this, my faith will be stronger as I come out the other side of it. As we go through something like COVID-19, something that almost none of us have been through before, it's challenging. But as we go into that challenge, as we're more than a month now into this challenge of self-distancing and all the rest of it, I really believe and I'm seeing more and more that I think we're going to be stronger when we come out of it. I think that for our faith too. I hope that you're doing family worship at home, that you are reading the Bible together and praying together and singing together with whoever is in your household. Or maybe you're doing that over Zoom or some other way to, to dig into God's Word together so when we can gather that we will be stronger, that we'll see that, that it'll be noticeable right away. Look how we've grown through this. You know, Thomas wasn't the only doubter in that group. We're told that all of the disciples doubted as the women came from the tomb and told them that Jesus had been raised from the dead, that all of them doubted it. In fact, it sounded like total nonsense to them, the Bible says. But God moved them from doubt to faith. And he do the very same thing for you. After he had appeared to Thomas, as we turn to Matthew's gospel, he's now appeared to the disciples at least three times, uh, Peter even four times. So they've seen Jesus a number of times now. And yet we're told that some of them still doubt. What do you think Jesus would do with a group of doubters? People who have faith but also have doubt at the same time time. I want to read this for you from Matthew 28. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. They worshipped Jesus, but some of them still doubted. Some of them are still doubting Jesus, even after they've seen him again and again and again. They're still doubting him. I love a couple things about this. A couple of these things just strike me as being so great. The first one is this. Jesus doesn't blow a gasket here. I mean, if this were me, I would lose my mind and just like sit them all down and fire them all, or at least some of them. Thomas, you're out of the band. Get out of here. Thaddeus, no one's ever even heard of you before. You're gone. I could replace you in a heartbeat. Jesus doesn't bench them all. He doesn't fire all these disciples. I love that about Jesus. He just continues to pour out his love and his grace on this group of guys. Another thing I love right here is this. They worship him even though they have some doubts. Did you catch that? They worshiped, but some doubted. But it sounds like they're all worshiping. Like they're all bowing down to Jesus. They're all praying to Jesus. They're all trusting in Jesus, even though some of them still doubt, even though some of them still aren't sure. They say, yes, I mean, this is still better than anything else I could imagine. And so I'm going to keep on worshiping him. Listen to this, these words that Jesus says to these doubters. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Some of these disciples are still doubting even as they worship Jesus. And Jesus doesn't say, man, I'm so disappointed with you guys. He doesn't say, that's it. I'm benching you. I'm starting over with some new disciples. And instead, he says, I've got a mission for you. I am sending you guys out. Even with your doubts, even with your questions, even with your fears, I'm sending you out. And here's the promise. I will be with you always. And as he does that, he continues moving them from doubt to faith. 
Church, I don't know if you have some questions, some doubts, some fears that you're wrestling with, but my hope and my prayer is that you'd know that this is the place for you, that the Christian faith is the place for you, that Hillside is the church for you, and I would love to walk with you. Please share those doubts, those questions, those challenges, those struggles with me so we can take this journey together because I believe that Jesus is with us and the Holy Spirit is with us, and as we address those doubts, we'll come out even stronger in our faith. I'd encourage you to pray this simple prayer that a man prayed to Jesus 2,000 years ago. Jesus, I believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Church, I miss you. I love you. I'm looking forward to when we can gather together all again whenever that might happen. Until then, may God continue to strengthen you in your faith as you worship together as families and as you trust in Jesus. In his name. Amen.